Good evening and welcome to the Black Dog Cafe. Let's give them a big round of applause. What a fabulous crowd. It's so nice to see all of you here. I'm Kimberly Nightingale, and I'm the executive director of the St. Paul Almanac. And we're an organization that builds community through sharing your stories. If you're interested in getting published, um, send your work in to us. Our website is www.stpaulalmanac.org, or you can email us a story or a poem at stories at stpaulalmanac.org. We pay all of our artists, we pay all of our writers. Uh, our new book is coming out in September. Your friends, your family, the artists that you love are in our book. We'd like to thank our sponsors. This activity is made possible in part by funds provided by the Lower Town Future Fund of the St. Paul Foundation and support from St. Paul Neighborhood Network. SPNN is here tonight, um, and they air our shows throughout the month on their cable network station. Can we give a big round of applause to SPNN? <laughs> We'd also like to give a big, huge thanks to Takumba Aiken. He draws the action as it's happening. Thank you, Takumba. If you, if you stay after the very end of the show, Takuma will um, show you all the drawing that he's been doing through the night of our great performers. Um, tonight's show is titled, The Blacker, the Berry. And our curator tonight is Shay Cage. Shay has traveled widely to such places as Canada, England, Africa, New York, Bosnia, France, and more. Teaching and performing her work that largely centers around topics of identity, class, cultural celebration, and home, she recently closed the play Nellie at the Minnesota History Theater, playing young Nellie alongside Greta Oglesby, followed by her first solo work at Intermedia Arts. Internationally, she's worked at the Hackney Empire Theater, Nottingham Playhouse, and Zion Arts in England. She was seen last in Appomattox at the Guthrie Theater and in Penumbra's production of Amen Corner. Notable local roles include Agnes in Agnes Under the Big Top at Mixed Blood, Helena in Eclipsed, Venus in Venus at Frank Theater, Josephine in Ruined at Mixed Blood, and The Bride in Blood Wedding at 10,000 Things. She's also worked with Illusion, Pangea, Jun Lun, and her film credits include Drop Dead Gorgeous, Midnight Chronicles, Cry About a Nickel, and Radio. Recent awards include a 2011 Emmy, I Believe in Public Access Commercial, a 2011 McKnight Theater Fellowship, and she was named a change maker by Women's Press. Impressive or what? Yes. Please welcome the fabulous, amazing Shea Cage. We stand, we stand on the backs of those who touch the bottom of the ocean's floor, right on the wings of butterflies to face our reflection in the mirror and smile. We stand on the backs of those who touch the bottom of the ocean's floor, right on the wings of butterflies, to face our reflection in the mirror and smile. The blacker the berry, they say, the sweeter the juice. Hmm, what that mean to you? Yeah, so I had the wonderful pleasure of asking, it started as like three other women, and then it quickly grew to 10, and then 12, and then 15, and then 20, and then 25, and I was like talking to somebody, and she said, well, why don't you just go ahead and go for 30? And I thought, when she said that, I said, or 50, or 100, yeah? Zenzile, we were at a meeting with, uh, and uh, talking to Obsidian Arts about the possibility of maybe growing this into something that um, also marries the visual art form uh, with the performance and uh, spoken art form. And I thought, at that meeting, I thought, what if there were 100 women of color on stage? Wouldn't that be wild? What? Has it been done before in Minnesota? <laughs> we could break a record. Um, I'm just so giddy, I'm so excited, um, I really am, uh, and I, I just, I'm so, yeah, <laughs> I'm so excited, I just, I love my people, I love my community, and just, there's so many of y'all here, and I'm so excited to see what these beautiful, prolific, 
Writers, performers, artists, actors, activists, leaders, teachers have come together to put together. Some of them, as I said, are performers. Some of them are not. Some of them are writers. Some of them are not. Some of them are teachers and educators. So we pose one prompt to everybody, the black of the berry, dot, dot, dot. And this is what they came up with. Sydney Haraday, my good friend, just suggested that we put all of the names in a hat. This will be a, like an imaginary hat. Does somebody have a hat? OK, we can put them in a hat or a box and pull the names in the order. Oh, I see a hat. OK, so how do you guys feel about that? <laughs> it will keep people on their toes, yeah? So we have a lot of artists. We're going to do this like what we call it, round robin style, almost like a cacophony. I know some of the artists are in the back, some are in the front. I know it's kind of hot. Are you guys hot? OK, so just fan, you know, treat it like church. Like fan, you know, kick off your jacket, start taking off layers, etc. And what I will do is I will call the name. What do you say? My, my, my. <laughs> All right, call a response. I will call the name, and I will, I ask every woman to introduce themselves with three words. And I will introduce themselves with their three words. They will come up, and there is a thread that ties all our pieces together, and it is, I remember. So we're responding to the prompt, the black of the berry, and each piece starts with, I remember. Ashe? Ashe. I go? Ashe. Turn to your neighbor and say, I go means, say, I may. All right. Now, what about the people that are like in the doorway? <laughs> you guys, are you going to stand back there? Is it going to be like for real church, like a wedding that you weren't invited to? <laughs> OK, well, because there's still room sort of in the front. So just make your way. I, I want people to be comfortable. Um, we're going to go back to back to back, and then we're going to have a quick Q&A at the very end. Is that all right? Artists, are you ready? Yes. Zinzile, send that envelope up front. If there's any artist that just came in that we missed, um, let us know. And we will put you in the I, I go? All right. I'd like to specially thank uh, Zinzile, Isoke, and uh, is it women and gender studies? Gender and women's sexuality um, at the University of Minnesota for also being a partner on this event and bringing some of the classmates, etc. All right. I'm so excited. I feel like it's like a Woo! game show and I have all of the tickets. Let's throw the bones. Ah, let's throw the bones. Okay. We will be sending this around for donations a little while. three readers. And just so you know, there's a tall mic and a short mic. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I didn't mean to do that. OK. Yeah. You can use, if you're tall, you can use the short one. If you're short, you can use the tall one. All right. So the first three that will go up will be Joy Lewis, Hope Cervantes, and Ramala Bile. You ready? Bile. Bile. All right. So ready. The black of the berry. Everybody say the black of the berry. The black of the berry. The sweet of the juice. The sweet of the juice. All right. Jamela, are you in the house? Jamela will anoint the space and open us up. And Jayanti, Kyle will close the space as well with song. After Jamela is done, we will have Joy Lewis, hopeful, orange, and grounded. All right. All right. Welcome, everyone. I uh, wrote a piece. When Shay called me, I felt so blessed. And so I immediately started to hear something in my head. And so I'm going to sing you what I wrote. What would this world be without me? What would this world be without me? 
For I am the darker berry. The sun beats down upon me. The sun has infected my DNA. Given me the most sought after chills. Giving me the darker skin. Some may say the darker the skin, the deeper the rule. But what would this world be? Without me, what would this world be without me, without me? From my womb came the cradle of civilization, the standards of a nation in such areas. As beauty has right music flows free from me, etc., 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 etc. When you see my burnt face, look upon me and see history, kingdoms and dynasties, for they all came from me. I am the darker, the darker sister, sister, sister is who I be, the original. Not hide. I will not hide. Look at me and what this world wants to be. Hey, they want to be me. They want to be me. Look at my lips and my hot cheekbones and my almond shaped eyes. These hips. Joy Lewis, hopeful, orange, grounded. <laughs> I remember, 
I remember when I learned how to eat my hurts and bags of potato chips, the hot kind, put all my favorite kind in a brown paper bag, red hot ripplets, Sundance, hot corn chips and cheese popcorn. If you shake it up all together, you would appear to have much more, more hope in that bag than in the world outside of it for a little black girl from East St. Louis. I tried the updated version recently, hot Cheetos and Takis, hot Cheetos and Takis. I can't get enough of those hot Cheetos and Takis. And just like that old version, it gave me temporary relief and false hope. I remember when my grandmother would cook all through the week for Sunday dinner, greens, sweet potato pies, turkey and dressing, cornbread, macaroni and cheese, the good kind made with the government cheese, y'all. <laughs> she was serving a place full of hope, love, dignity. At least once a week, we could come together and eat that soul food that helped us swallow the racism, the sexism, the homophobia, the discrimination, the injustice of it all. Wash it all down with a big glass of red Kool-Aid on Sundays, y'all. Nowadays, I try hard not to eat my hurts and just stop and feel them and take them to my yoga mat and truly embrace the black of the berry, the sweet of the juice that makes this black girl run towards justice and freedom for all. Thank you. Ramla Bile, retrospective, unexpected, carefree. I remember when I was seven and my brother Mohammed and I spent our summer days playing catch, kicking rocks under the piercing San Diego sun. We cooled down by sipping on blueberry slurpees on the steps of the 7-Eleven. When we got home, my mom's scrunched nose directed us straight to the shower, which washed away the smell of salty air and fresh cut grass, but left a singe of summer fire that left me looking like toasted caramel. It was midsummer when our relatives from Atlanta came to visit, and my mother made my sisters and I wear baby poo colored faux silk pants and matching shirt dresses with black scarves that laid somewhere between our heads and our shoulders. We were indeed a colorful sight to anyone but my mom. At least we were in ugly solidarity together. We were slouched on the plastic covered sofa when the guests finally arrived. My dad introduced the couple as my uncle and his wife. They approached my sisters first, blurting out how beautiful they were with rich compliments liberally embellished with ade. Ade, a term of endearment in Somali that means light or fair, also used to imply pure. My term came and I braced myself for a storm of similar compliments. It never came. They asked for my name before giving me a hurried hug and moving along to the boys. I hid in my parents' room the rest of the night. When my mother found me tear-faced on their bed hours later, she assured me that I was her smartest daughter and that I didn't need to concern myself with superficial things like beauty. Besides, you're not really that dark. You're just not light, she explained. <laughs> Her seemingly comforting words were a blow to my ego. To me, it was all the confirmation I needed that my skin denied me beauty. Days passed and I was still wounded from the week before. One afternoon, my dad, his friend Dawood, and I were on Interstate 5 when we saw a car pulled over on the shoulder of the highway. Two African-American women were standing beside a stalled car with no help in sight. It was San Diego in the 90s and we knew that if we didn't pull over, they'd be hard pressed to get any help for hours. When the car finally failed to start after repeated attempts, my dad offered to drive the women to their home in San Isidro. Embarrassed by my dry lips, I kept licking them to restore moisture and seal the dreaded ash. One of the women finally said, it's okay, you don't have to do that. Your lips are dark like mine and they're beautiful. Her words stunned me into silence. I had never heard the words dark and beautiful uttered in the same sentence. I examined her face and observed her beauty. It was then that I realized that beauty isn't contingent upon pink lips or light brown skin with, a, with hints of rouge. That was the year when summer kissed my face and Allah showed me the beauty of all shades through a stranger. I didn't know the vernacular of black consciousness those days, but, it was, but was all too familiar with the cold shudder of not being light enough. 
My mother, like many other immigrants of her generation, had little to reference regarding the devastation that colorism caused in the context of racial friction and violence in America. And while the Somali community appears to be homogenous, colorism runs deep, perhaps a vestige of colonial power that refuses to let go. But the common thread across generations is the intersectionality between colorism and patriarchy. What is left to say when, what is left to say when so many of our mothers and sisters fall prey to skin lightning creams and other hazardous interventions while their male counterparts are free from the chains of such pressure? Ashay, yeah. wow. <laughs> Ashay. Side note. The blackberry is an edible fruit produced by many species in the rubus family. What distinguishes blackberries from its raspberry relatives is whether the torus receptacle picks with the fruit a blackberry or remains on the plant when picked, leaving a hole in the fruit, a raspberry. The term bramble, a word meaning any impenetrable scrub, has traditionally been applied specifically to the blackberry or its products, though in the US it applies to all members of the rubus family. <clears throat> Next up, Hope Cervantes, playful, feisty, a dreamer. I remember. I remember Mahalia Jackson's voice floating through her apartment, the smell of glory greens and sweet potato pie hanging in the air, the countless colorful pills that had to be ingested every few hours, and the rhythmic hissing of the oxygen tank that made me think of the ocean waves in love and repulsed by the sand all at the same time. Baby, will you scratch my back? Yes, ma'am. I secretly loved doing this, as it made me feel useful. And the thought of pleasing my granny made me all the more eager. Ooh, not too hard, baby. <laughs> baby, will you pass me my pills? Yes, ma'am. That too excited me, knowing I was helping in some way. Little did I know how vital they really were. I catch whispers here and there about the past of this beautiful black woman I call Granny. Years of physical and mental abuse, raising six children all on her own. For a long time, I thought to be a black woman meant to struggle, to be abused, to be mistreated and underappreciated. It wasn't until I got older that I saw my Granny for the woman she really was, a warrior not a victim, to smile in the face of racism, to defy all limitations, to create something beautiful with what she was given. It wasn't until she left this world that I really understood why she was so joyful. It was doing things for others, her compassion that kept her in this world long after the doctors had given up on her. She was planting these seeds of service in her own granddaughter. It's when I'm at my lowest and I want to give up that I hear her whisper in my spirit, baby, think of all the people you can be of service to. Everyone is waiting for hope. And I look up at the heavens and I say, yes, ma'am. Right. Next three. Nicole Smith, Soul, and Susie Chang. Nicole Smith, yeah. former preteen beauty queen, balloon phobic, early 90s, it's either dance or Janet enthusiast. <laughs> Show us some love. All right, good evening. Thank you, Shay, first off, for introducing me and inviting me to this. So um, I'll just kick it out. Um, I remember 
I remember ancestral, secretive, societal stories say, my father raped my mother. Immaculate conception conceived by greed and power. Once he tasted her, he couldn't get enough. Consumed by the notion of this unchartered territory, her black and berry became his obsession. Like a virgin, she was to him. Madonna to his Judas. Hymen intact, he pushed into her, torn into her, made no love to her. She bled. Bred bastard babies who were ripped from her before they could say her name, say her name. These children of destiny destined never to know her identity. To them, she was a distant, faceless, faded memory. Daddy took care of all that. Sitting securely in his lap, he held on tight, making sure we didn't need to worry about where we came from. Mother did her deed, fulfilled that need, forced to breed, forced to be, freeze, trapped, wrapped in the constraints of submissive societal imposed sub-rank. Carrying the stench of daddy's residual stink as he lays, plays, in the pungent wet spots of these sexual acts, repeatedly beating, breaking mother's back with no concern, discern for her, for her humanity, objectified beyond belief, plagued by immense grief, she continues to weep, grieve, holding close to her heart the vacant X-marked spot where her children would've, could've, should've suckled. Instead, they were malnourished by strange fruit of the foreign land, force fed by the hands of man that declared, this land is your land. How soon these men came to forget that proclamation, declaration of independence. Must have repented this. No number of Hail Marys full of grace will forgive these for these immeasurable acts of misery. Communal consumption, thirstily drinking in mother's essence, drunk off her spirits. Here, daddy still staggers and sways. Mother, I recall, I remorse, I remember, and I will never forget. Thank you. Side note, brown girl, you are majesty manifested in female form. There's some babies in the house, yeah? Show your love for the babies, y'all. Yeah. Mine is on the way or running around somewhere in the back or upstairs right now. Um, yeah, and it's going, is this gonna be on TV? Are we gonna be on TV? We're gonna be on TV. Yeah. I hate censorship, but just a reminder, yeah, we gotta keep it clean for the babies. No, you, you're fine, just moving forward. Um, yeah, this is some beautiful work, yeah? Especially when we start, it's, it's funny, cause somebody was asking me about art the other day, and she really, she really didn't understand. Um, she understood art as like visual artist. And, um, and I wasn't offended with her ignorance, but she, she couldn't gra grasp around the fact that I'm an artist. And she's like, well, what is it that you do? And why is it so important? And why wouldn't you just get a job at, um, you know, like a Piper Jaffrey and et cetera to make ends meet? I mean, the struggling thing. And um, it was a really interesting conversation. And what it did is, it, it helped me to sort of re-embrace just those times in our lives that we're, we're made to re-embrace why we do the art <laughs> and how we can't imagine life without it. I can't imagine life without the art, but I also can't imagine it without the community. Yeah, and I never ever thought that I would be able to find a community like mine back home here. Um, so just turn to your neighbor and say, you look good. 
You look, you look real good. You look good. Don't they look good? Ashe, Ashe. Susie Chang. I have Susie Chang coming. She, she is, her word is lost map. Look at how many people there are right now. This is awesome. You all are so beautiful. Okay. Here? Okay. All right. <laughs> I remember the time when I had a huge identity crisis. You know, you sound like a white girl. What are you? What? <laughs> what does that even mean? I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm sure the little old white woman didn't mean anything negative, but I definitely had to do a mental double take. I mean, it's not every day that I'm reminded of the color of my skin, right? What are you? Well, I'm an 18-year-old female going to the U of M. Um, I'm a barista at a coffee shop in the Seward neighborhood. I like to, oh, oh, you meant what ethnicity am I? Well, I'm Cambodian Chinese. What, what are you? Mikmi, ne ang merkang te, ne ang kmai. That was my mother's pleasant way of telling me, you are not American, you are Cambodian, okay? But I was born in America, right? So what am I? Am I American? Am I Asian? Why, why can't I be both? She said that we couldn't be like the other people in our neighborhood because we lived in a trailer in Plymouth. I was like, okay. And my parents tell me that I shouldn't forget the language. I shouldn't forget to bow my head to my elders. I shouldn't forget to thank Buddha for the life I have because if I do, who's going to continue with the Khmer bud lines? I am an artist. I am an artist because I can't afford to forget who I am. I want to write stories about how I couldn't fully have a conversation with someone until I was five because I kept going back and forth between English and Cambodian. Because I want to write about that genocide that happened between the upper class and lower class Cambodian people. Not because I have to, because my parents told me to, but because I want to. It's peculiar how our society talks about how race isn't that big of a deal anymore, yet we like to point out racial stereotypes and foreign behaviors in so many ways. It's a, it's a repetitive and never-ending conversation. History repeats itself. Maybe not in the same way, but manipulated. And because I'm in a relationship with a white male, people like to make jokes about, oh, he has yellow fever. And, you're a submissive schoolgirl school that wants power from the white man, right? And because I'm an artist and not a doctor, I'm the black sheep of the family. Because I sound like a white girl, I'm treated differently. Oh, she could be a gangbanger. People don't have to ask me to repeat what I have to say. Because I live on my own instead of living with my parents, a lot of Cambodians' families think that I'm disrespecting the culture. I'm currently in a lifelong identity crisis, no matter if I'm American, if I'm Asian, or simply because I'm Susie, <laughs> trying to be respected by the people who share the same blood with me and trying not to be alienated because of the color of my skin. Mm. Thanks, guys. Arlita Little. Contemplative, inquisitive, and subversive. Show us some love. <laughs> so I thought I'd do a little storytelling in honor of the oral tradition tonight. You know, uh, we've been reading Voodoo Dreams as part of the Givens uh, Black Books community reading campaign. There's literature throughout, so check it out. But I've been learning so much about Dambele. And Dambele is the voodoo god of death and the underworld, who often appears as a snake or in a snake form. And Dambele loves the ladies. 
so he would be quiet at home tonight. He's equal opportunity, but the black of the berry. It's made me think about times in my life when Dambele has come close to or crossed my path. I remember when I was 12 years old, I went to visit my father at his home in Accra. And his house had a wide yard and a fence around it. And he had hired a young man named John to help him with the yard. But you know, in Ghana, there's a wide variety of snakes, including cobras. So he had said to John, if you see any snakes in the yard, kill them. So one day, my father and I were uh, leave, just leaving the house, and John comes up to my father, and he says, Mr. Little, I just want you to know there's a snake in the yard. And my father said, well, John, did you see the snake? And John said, well, yes, I saw the snake. And so my father looked at him and frowned, and he said, well, John, if you saw the snake, why didn't you kill it? And John said, well, Mr. Little, last night I was sitting in front of the guardhouse, and the snake crawled right in front of me across the walking path. And I thought I would get my machete and kill it. But when I stood up, the snake stood up too. <laughs> so I sat back down. <laughs> he knew Dambele, and now I know Dambele. The next three, Christina Benz, Signe Haraday, and Wisdom Mawusi. Christina Benz, educator, artist, and sister to many. Show your love. Turn to your neighbor while she comes here the neighbor that you didn't turn to the first time and say, hey, what you thinking? <laughs> Good evening. I remember there were times in my life that made an impression on me when it came to my beauty, a woman's figure and how it should look and be. As I grow into my skin, I understand my figure is like a berry as it changes and matures. I'm loving it now, but it hasn't been that easy. I remember growing up and being raised by my mother's side, which is Italian, which was always around and a huge part of my heritage. I loved my nonna's pasta, sauce, and cannoli. Food always brought us together for celebrations and holidays, but sometimes it tore me apart because as food was always around me, so were comments about how I needed to lose 10 or 15 pounds. I always, I always carried my weight around my hips and thighs, and as a young woman, I had a hard time with this advice. There was always a time, another time in my life that stuck out with me, even more when I was a young person in junior high. And my peer told me I should um, play a different instrument because my lips were too big to play the flute. Her comments stuck with me, but I must have done something right because I can still play, read, I can still play, mu can still play the flute and read music. I am turning 30 this year, and I feel like I am more comfortable with my figure more than ever. It is like a berry, maturing and more sweet with age. I'm OK with the fullness of my hips, my lips, and my thighs, and I have come to peace with the roundness of my figure. I am blessed that I have many strong whim women and sisters in my life that I can relate to that have shown me new ways to appreciate and love my figure 
and be myself as a strong woman. Nemo Farah, joyful, curious, confused. Show us some love. Salam. Hi, everybody. Peace and blessings be upon you. I thought I'd time myself because um, this topic was kind of hard for me to come up with something, so I thought I'll just, you know, whatever comes to me when I got here is whatever, whatever I was going to share with you all. So I'm going to time myself. I also wanted to say be some, a peace and blessings on um, my mentor and late ancestor, Deborah Torrain, who invited me to be here for the first time um, in 2010. <clears throat> So when I was thinking about um, this, I, I thought about how my name has changed since coming to America and where I come from. And so in my journey, my name has changed four times, right? And so I thought about it in the four um, seasons and how my skin color changes <laughs> in the four seasons. And I'm the darkest when it's summer and when I'm in Africa. Um, so <clears throat> I was born in, in Mogadishu, that's the capital of Somalia. And um, you know, it's kind of like the Kandahar of the world. I was born in a hospital called Benadir, and uh, I came along a time when my parents were doing really well uh, with their careers and their finances. So they named me Naima, which means prosperity or heaven at the time. And so um, uh, my mom was really sick, and my dad was in America at the time, so he thought we weren't going to be okay, so he traveled back. And then it turned out that we were both okay, so I was the only child. I have. Uh, 11 siblings, and I'm the 10th child. And so I was the only child in my family that had um, a naming ceremony. So there were all these animals slaughtered in my name and all these things, and everybody in the neighborhood got invited, and we all ate well. So I was Naima at the time. And then um, and my, my, at around four years old, um, my mom decided to teach me how to read and write. So she taught me how to read and write with my last name, which was Naima Hussein Farah Ali Mahmoud Hassan Hussein Abu Kar Muhammad Mumin Adam Fiqh I can trace it all the way back to my clan. <laughs> and I didn't realize how important this was until two years ago when I went back to Somalia and it became my address and my social security. So whenever I got lost, I was like, I'm Naima Hussein, but can you tell me where home is? <laughs> um, but then, and then my grandma used to call me Naima Nadar. She'd say Naima Nadar in the Urone, and Nadar means um, beautiful sight, and in the Urone uh, means the same thing. And I would say, yes, ayayo ma'an, um, which she taught me how to be sweet in exchanges. I would say, yes, sweet grandma. And I was like, I thought I was her favorite child because she would always call my name when she needed anything. Um, Fast forward, right before I started school, um, this huge explosion happened in Somalia, and there was a civil war, so we ended up in a refugee camp. And my name <coughs> sort of changed because my whole family got displaced. And in the displacement, what happened is we lost my dad and a bunch of the boys in my family, and um, we ended up in a refugee camp with my mom. And so. Um, nobody knew where anybody was. And so what ended up happening is my dad went back to his uh, uh, village and ended up getting married to his like distant cousin or whatever. And they had a child. Their first daughter became Naima, which was my name at the time. So when we found out, I was like, what? So I changed. I asked to have my name changed to Nim'a, which is the Somali version of Naima. Um, and then so I'm, I was Nim'a at that time. And then a few years later, we got sponsored to come to America in 1994. And nobody, no American can say Nim'a because it comes from here. So, <laughs> so then people started calling me Nimco. And I didn't like the cat sound in my name. So I decided, I'm like, Hoyo, which is a mom, can we please drop the cat or the C in my name and call me Nemo? And so I became Nemo that way. I don't really know what Nemo means, but most <laughs> recently, even with Nemo, Americans, I have a hard time saying it. So I have to say, like the fish. <laughs> or to older people, it's like, like the captain, a movie character that I don't know. <laughs> I haven't watched the movie, but it's some captain in a movie. Or more, <laughs> most recently, it was a, a snowstorm in Boston named Nemo, too. So that's another thing. 
Um, and then, <laughs> and then also when I travel, I call myself N dot because it's like N period or full stop. Because um, you know, nobody, no stranger wants to really know your name, and it's like this whole story. So I just call myself N whenever I travel if people inquire. But it made me think about names and how you know it kind of changes with who we are and um, the the color of names and you know what I mean, the identity that's attached to names, and 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 also just kind of in driving here thinking about all of that. I also thought about the four seasons and how I'm Naima, which is in, in English actually it's more of Na Naima, uh, that John Coltrane song. Naima, so it's very popular in America. And then Nim'a, and then Nemo, and then and that. So I just thought I'll share a little bit of history of names. Thank you. <laughs> So we have like 10, 10 more left. And each of us has up to a minute. I believe that we can get through them, yeah? And we're gonna end the same way we began with Jay Anthony Kyle closing us out with song. So, Marcy Rendon, Anishabe, mother, grandmother. I remember the morning Mrs. Olivia Jones was born. Her afro made Angela Davis jealous. Her newborn copper skin outshone her mother's smile. Ms. Olivia Jones brings to mind the story of my mother. My mother would lie on the daybed reading true love and true confessions. Fantasy feeding her mind while I stood swinging bare feet in the doorway. Hunger making my stomach touch my back saying, Mom, I'm hungry, until she looked up, wondering who I was and where I came from. Children didn't exist in true love, only men who rescued women from hard lives and desperate situations. My mother's hunger was greater than mine, her cupboards more bare than our kitchen. I just didn't know it at the time. She put the magazine on her chest, saw me, Three years tall, dust-covered legs, bare feet, unbrushed hair, my protruding stomach touching my back. She sighed and said, the choke cherries are ripe. Go pick some choke cherries. The blackest berries are the sweetest. And then she went back to reading. I ate choke cherries until my stomach bloated and then ate some more, spitting the hard round seeds at birds that flittered by. Years later, after a fasting ceremony, elders gave me chokecherry juice to drink, saying, drink, medicine comes from the blackest berries, the sweetest of the fruit. Talk about it. At four years old, Ms. Olivia Jones still rivals Angela Davis's hairdo. Her beauty stops strangers on the street. She has a secret smile only she can decipher. With her sweetness, she feeds her mama's hunger for life, and loving her is medicine for all. Miigwech. We're so blessed to have uh, Marcy. She just got back from Australia, and Sydney just flew in also today from New York. So a uh, shade to all the beautiful women that made space for this event. Linnea Dublet, silly, blessed, stress. Show us some love. Hey. 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 <laughs> I'm a little nervous. Snap her up, y'all. I remember a time when I was complaining to my friend May about how I would never meet a man in Minnesota. Nope. Not in this frozen tundra where the men expect you to approach them and get down on one knee and say, would you do me the honor of lying to me for six months while you focus on other women in the city that you can scam? <laughs> See, me and May had just came out from um, salsa dancing. It was one of our salsa dancing excursions. And I was tired, and she was tired, and I was just like, that's it. I am never going to meet a guy here. I mean, it's just not going to happen. I am destined, it appears, to be single. 
unless I pick up and move someplace awesome like Chicago, DC, you know, someplace where there are prospects. Anyway, I kept on with this great complaint, and May says to me, listen, listen, listen to me. Growing up in Malaysia, I had this friend Susan, and she was so sweet and smart and just a great girl. But she was the friend that never had a boyfriend. She was always the single girl. So when our group of guys, or excuse me, when our group of friends would want to go out with our guys, we would always feel bad about leaving Susan out. May continues, my friends and I would plan special dates that would include hang time with Susan and then date night with our guys. Okay, long story short, a few years passed and we were all getting ready and going to head out to the university and uh, Susan comes to a party that one of my friends is throwing and she introduces us to her boyfriend, Frank, and we're like, Susan got a boyfriend. What? No, Susan got a boyfriend. Anyway, long story short again, Susan and Frank end up getting married. And my friend May, she says to me, see Linnea, Susan's dark too, and she found somebody. So there's always hope. <laughs> Thank you. Audacious, elegant, and story maker. Hi. Hi. Uh, like everybody else said, I mean, you get to this point and it's like, how do you choose? Which story do I choose? Which story do I choose? I have millions. So anyway, mine is short and sweet. I remember realizing that the idea of me, culled from a bullet point bio, divorced from my physical presence, was open to interpretation. I had an interview for an assistant to the audiobooks program manager position at Simon & Schuster in New York. I met the program manager. Oh, she said, uh, when I heard your name, I just thought, you know, Scandinavian girl from Minnesota. <laughs> It was only awkward for a moment, and we warmed to one another quickly. It was a great interview. I never thought of Adia Morris as a white-sounding name. I mean, it comes attached, just like my skin and hair. Uh, but when that name on paper is followed by Minnesota and Duke University and over the phone, this voice, I can see how some people might be confused. I didn't get the job, initially. A month later, they called me back and said, the guy we hired, he didn't really work out. Do you want the job? I turned him down. Shavonda Horsley got the thunder. Must be the ninth wonder, not over, but under. Shavonda, where you at? Zinzile, I'm going to have you come just forward just a little bit as well. And Sharla, you're after her. Okay. Pour some love. Oh, not quite. So we use this one. Hey. 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 All right. I remember portraits of Malcolm and Martin in Mother's living room. Black berets. Brothers wearing all black even in the summertime, and I'm from Texas. Braids with multi-colored beads, dookie braids like from Poetic Justice, parted hair with double-stranded twists and grease dripping down my neck like beads of sweat that brothers still get when they're stopped by the cops. I remember my second cousin with long locks telling stories of when she was married at 14 and living life having the finer things. I still don't know what her husband did for a living. But her stories were fascinating, so I sat close to her feet and listened. I remember peace, love, and soul train. I remember growing up black to a Motown soundtrack. I remember crack, crack cocaine. Somebody done stole my bike. <laughs> I remember boys in the hood, Rosewood, 
something like Tulsa, Oklahoma. I remember folks getting shot, so mama had a metal box. Glad I never saw the inside. I remember talking drums and my spirit leaving my body and settling back in after dancing, African. I remember, I ain't never seen so many black men from the continent, the diaspora, beautiful, educated, and looking fly. I remember I wanted to curse out the makeup teacher after going home and putting my hair into the style she said my hair couldn't accomplish. I remember getting kicked out of college. <laughs> I remember nights like this, I wish raindrops would fall. Nights like this, I wish raindrops would fall. I remember I remember feeling like there is no place in the world for a black girl. I remember feeling like there is no place in the world for a black girl. I've been raped in all my lives. 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 I remember why the cage bird sings, wings clipped. I remember running, 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 because that was the only way to regain my wings. I remember, I remember everything exists because of me. Black. Wait, wait. Black. 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 I think we can do it. All right, so Sharla, Eliza, this is how it's gonna go down. We're gonna show as much love as we did for these last five as we did for the beginning ones. The last five, I'm gonna ask you to weave your way towards the front so they can go back to back to back. Um, and ideally, I'm gonna just try this. I'm gonna introduce two, both of you, and then so Sharla, as soon as you're done, Eliza will go up. So Sharla, so I'll introduce Eliza first. Eliza Rashid, crazy, fun, and loyal. But first, Sharla Marie Bailey, sexy, real, and charming. Oh. This thing has been driving me crazy. Let's go, put it over there. I remember when I was a little girl, I wanted to be light-skinned like my mama because I thought she was so pretty. Then I heard Tupac say, that some say, the blacker the berry, the sweeter the juice. I say the darker the flesh, then the deeper the roots. And I lost my mind. <laughs> Could nobody tell me I wasn't cute. <laughs> but some often tried. Dark-skinned women are ugly and mean because they so dark. You pretty for a dark-skinned girl. But anyway, let's talk about those sweet roots. My granny was the sweetest person I knew. Now, she wasn't my mama's complexion or mine, but somewhere in the middle. Now get this, there are so many shades of black. There's brown, blue, marron, mahogany, chocolate. <laughs> but listen, you, 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 me, we are all beautiful. So don't kill the self-esteem in this world. Dark flesh, deep roots. Dark flesh, deep roots. Dark flesh, sweet juice. Dark flesh, deep roots. Dark flesh, sweet juice. Sweet you, sweet you, sweet you, sweet you. Love you, love you, love you, love you, love you, 
love you. Um, I, this performance inspired by Black or the Berry, but I didn't talk about Black or Berry, I talk about apples. <laughs> so when you hear apples, think about them as blackberries. <laughs> All right. I remember the faded photograph of my grandfather, whom I have never met. My grandfather is a little short, or was a little short. You know, he's not a very tall man. but. Looking at him in that photograph, he stood tall, dark, and handsome. Hair shining like the midnight. He drowned his woolly black hair in coconut oil the night before he went to get his photos taken. So his hair looked shiny and slick. Wearing an iron press white shirt and the lungi, my grandfather smiled from year to year for the camera. As a child, I would look at this photograph and be mesmerized by the different shades my grandfather's white shirt, his dark brown skin against his white shirt, his white teeth, his white teeth against his dark brown skin, his woolly black hair, his woolly black hair against the light backdrop. That day, when I first met my father, I thought it was my grandfather leaping out of that photograph coming back to life. And really, looking at all my family photos, I've always wondered how can an apple be fallen so far from the tree? My father's skin is that of black coffee, strong, dark, and deep. Mother's is milky, light, soft, and smooth. And mine, it's nothing like theirs, but somewhere in between. In the summer, it becomes golden, dark, olive tan. And then during the cold, cold Minnesota winter, when there's not enough sunlight and vitamin D, well, it becomes kind of caramel-ish. Uh, I look nothing like my parents. How can I be so different from them? We are not from the same apple tree, at least not from the outside. So what makes us belong together? How can I be from the womb that bore me and the seed that planted me? As much as I don't want to think about it because they are my parents after all, but I really have to think hard and deep. I needed to really think hard and deep so I can validate my own existence. Who am I? Why do I look like this? Uh, how did I get here? I had to think about the seed inside the apple. You know, that's how the tree becomes the tree in the first place, right? The apple seed. Anyway, if an apple seed was transplanted halfway across the ocean and raised on a different soil, would it taste like the apple as we know it? Well, years later after our first meet and greet, when my father became more stable and significant in my life, I was taught that even though the apple landed far from the tree, but the seed, the seed that the apple grew out of is still part of that original tree. Just as sweet, but maybe sweet differently. Thank you. Kimmy Ojolade, shy, shy, shy. Next up, Beverly Kopman, energetic, renaissance, and wondering. Kimmy, where you at? Kimmy, let her through. Kimmy, come. <laughs> Beverly, where are you? Beverly. And Tish Jones, you will close us out as uh, right before Jayanti. When being black was exotic, my first college roommate 
lived in a town where there were no black people. From the first time we met and throughout the semester, she would stare at me for an uncomfortable length of time <laughs> in all of my blackness. Sure, you can stare at me, I thought. A part of me got a kick out of it. Being from a community in Nigeria where we do not think of ourselves as being black, you are either Yoruba, Igbo, or Ausa, or many other tribes. What makes one special is what one can do, one's skills, whether you're good, so good at sewing or crafting or the fastest runner. Things that really matter, like your abilities, not, your, not the color of your skin. For this roommate of mine, she has never come in contact with a black person before in her life. Her experience of black people is only what she has seen on TV or in movies. When um, her family come to visit, they will um, stare around just looking at me. I used to think, well, you can just look all you want. But they were thinking maybe wanted to touch me and probably taste my skin to see if it tastes like chocolate. There was a part of me that was um, really sad because of this. And then I, I would think, I would say, wow, I can be in a museum. <laughs> I, I am something that can be stared at, gawked at. I am an object. I am no longer a human being. I am an object to be touched. That part of me was sad, knowing that there are people in this world that do not understand different cultures. Just because I don't look like you does not mean that people like me do not exist. There are people in this world that I have never come in contact with. And I know that if I come in contact with them, I will be open to understand them, their culture, not just the color of their skin. It was an interesting experience with my roommate. And I hope that she got something out of our many conversations other than I was the black person she had never seen before. And what a mystery that is. Thank you. I remember crinolines dipped in heavy starch and hung over the bathtub to drip dry, then worn under a circle, poodle skirt, a cinch waist belt, angora sweater, bobby socks and saddle shoes. It took courage to go against the style and fashion of the day, but when I tried it, I liked it. It was the coral colored straight skirt with kick pleat and dyed to match sweater set that set me apart. I felt older and more sophisticated in my flower toed ballet flats and imitation pearls. When I switched hairstyles from ponytail to page boy, I knew I was on my way. I remember changing out of school shoes and clothes and into those for play, which bore the most evidence of mending and being handed down from older, bigger siblings and relatives or from the children in the f families, white children in the families she worked for. Sunday clothes were the best. They were usually bought for Easter from J.C. Penney or Sears and Roebuck. In good times, there would be a spring coat, straw hat, black patent leather Mary Janes, and purse, socks with ruffled lace cuffs and bright white gloves. The selection process began in February with looking through the catalogs, choosing the items, and beginning the weekly lay-by lay plan payments. Usually everything fit, but sometimes shoes had to be stuffed with cotton or Kleenex and two big coat sleeves hemmed. A too small dress or shirt made for some miserable spring and summer Sunday mornings. 
My white crocheted gloves were a gift from my godmother, Aunt Lucille. I felt so fancy and beautiful and grown up and special and brand new, just like Easter. I remember streetcar riding black women traveling from two flower pots on the front porch rail to rose gardens and wide lawns. Their starched and iron uniforms neatly folded in brown paper bags. They'd sit erect and dignified, speaking quietly and with pride of this daughter's good marks in school, that grandson's first communion, a husband who had finally landed a job, and the perfectly good, except for a small gravy stain, linen tablecloth that Miss Ann was going to throw out, but then offhandedly said, Martha, would y'all like to have this? Tish Jones, a new, humbled, old creation here. We belong here too. We deserve education. Black is beautiful. J, 1960. I remember Anne when I write, an Alabama berry, barely 17 at the time, was sentenced to rot on a poplar tree for pinning thoughts of being free to the local paper. She, an unruly seed, is survived by me. Eight years old, legs folded beneath me like bird wings. I watched my grandmother like a movie. Studied the squint of her eyes, the feather of her hair, the bend there in her tone, and the weight she wore above furrowed brow. Lines that read the blues of blacks in bold appearances. I lived for these moments, for words I didn't know in God by name. I was her witness, wide-eyed and interested, innocent and brown, not yet trained to bite my tongue. Looking at her, I saw something broken in her smile and hungered for what done it, so I asked her how we got here. Why she quivers whenever near flame? What lights the fire in her throat whenever someone tries to choke mine? How come she's never hushed me, I ask her, and she quickly trips back to this pressure on back to react and respond to the wrong imposed on her people, to the night she was visited by cloaks who'd make ghosts of brown men, to when King was prince becoming martyr, to when she authored the letter that would shape the way she spoke forever to her sweater soaked in spit and sweat, to her skull split open, scalp ripped, severed hip, teeth falling from her lips, parades of sweaty white fists stampeding her person and her family's blood pooling at the feet of the offenders. I was eight the day my grandmother's dentures spoke centuries onto my skin when they slipped. Eight, the day the pieces of my past were first presented, eight the day I began to remember myself. Marion berries, Boston berries, Logan berries, and other black berries are high in gallic acid, rudin and elactic acid, a known chemo preventative with antiviral and antibacterial properties. With their dark blue colors, blackberries have one of the highest antioxidant levels of fruits regularly tested. Blackberries are also rich in vitamin C and fiber, which have been shown to help reduce the risk of certain cancers. Blackberries are low in calories, carbohydrates, and have no fat, which makes them popular in low carb and low calorie diets. Blackberries are good for you. Black girls, black women are beautiful. Grandmother told me, she said, no matter how strong you are, 
brown girl. There will be days when you fall down, trip over yourself, get twisted up. Remind yourself of your beauty by finding your sisters, your sistren, your family, your community. Look to them to be renewed. Yes, Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. J. Anthony Kyle, new mother, fighter, activist, sister, kindred spirit, always, always moving out and moving up. Close us out, Ashe. I want to sing so many songs for you tonight, but I'm just going to sing. Two. <laughs> See the little brown girl, she's as old as me. She looks just like chocolate. Oh, mommy, can't you see? We are both in first grade. She sits next to me. I took care of her mom when she scraped her knee. She sang a song so pretty on the jungle gym. When Jimmy tried to hurt her, I punched him in the chin. <laughs> mom, can she come over and play dolls with me? We'd have so much fun, Ma. What? Why not? Why not? Oh, I see. No more action black for me. No more, no more. No more action black for me. Many thousand gone. Many thousand gone. No more peck of corn for me. No more, no more. No more peck of corn for me. Many thousand gone. Many thousand gone. No more pinch of salt for me. No more, no more. No more pinch of salt for me. Many thousand gone. Many thousand gone. No more slavery chains for me. No more, no more. No more slavery chains for me. Many thousand gone. Many thousand gone. No more masters wear for me. No more, no more. No more masters wear for me. Many thousand gone, many thousand gone. No more auction block, no more auction block. No more auction block. Many thousand gone, many thousand gone. Many, many thousand gone. I want to thank Kimberly and Nigel and uh, St. Paul Almanac and all of the beautiful, amazing uh, women today. Uh, stay posted. We're going to grow this baby, yeah? Because it, it's a baby, and it's, it, needs a, it needs some nurturing, and there's something here. There's something here that's precious. Um, so stay posted. I'm going to try to do something like uh, network everybody together, like on Facebook that I'm horribly delinquent on. But what I'll do is post everybody's name that performed here today. And you guys just like go to my Facebook and connect with them and be like, oh, I saw you and you said this and what do you do, et cetera. 
Takumba has been sketching artwork the whole while. Oh my Lord. That's us. This is the face of our community. Yeah. yeah. Give it up for Takumba Aiken. Beautiful. And thank you to the Black Dog. <laughs>